In 1953, Walter and Jean Gong were recent Stanford graduates and new school teachers. Garrett Walter Gong was their first child, and he has been a cherished son all his life. His mother was a convert to the church, and his father was a Christian when they married, but joined the church a few years later. So being sealed as a very young child to his family in the temple is one of my husband's earliest memories. He remembers the light, the kind people dressed in white, and the joy of being with his family in the temple. A California boy, Elder Gong grew up loving to camp and taking photographs of beautiful places. He was a really conscientious student. Have any of you been like this? He would turn in his assignments a few days early, get the teacher's comments, revise the assignments, and turn them in again, usually for perfect marks. Um, it, at 17, he won a scholarship to BYU Provo, and at 19, he was called to serve in the Taipei Taiwan Mission. At BYU, when he returned, he studied Asian Studies and Curriculum Design. We met as he was finishing at BYU, and he was working part-time teaching a Chinese culture class at the MTC, and I was there preparing for my mission to Taiwan. Elder Gong was a creative and inspiring teacher, and I was impressed. Later, after my mission, <clears throat> and after his completing a master's degree at Oxford University, we had 30 days on the same continent, during which time we were able to get to know each other a little bit. He went back to Oxford to work on a second degree, and we were engaged via a long-distance phone call and married a few weeks later. I thought I was marrying a professor-to-be and that we would settle in a leafy college town and have a very quiet life. I was wrong. Since finishing a PhD in international relations at Oxford, Elder Gong has been the Asia Director and China Chair at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. He was a foreign policy advisor to a U.S. presidential campaign. He was special assistant to the Under Secretary of Secretary State at the he was special assistant to the undersecretary at the U.S. Department of State. He's been special assistant to U.S. ambassadors in China and assistant to the president at BYU. He's been on the board of the U.S. Department of Education, National Accreditation Advisory Committee, and many other things. My father has sometimes wondered if Elder Gong could keep a job. <laughs> we have four sons and three beautiful grandchildren. Elder Gong's callings have included seminary teacher, bishop, stake president, Area 70, and now at General Authority 70. He's currently president of the Asia area, which has 18 countries, most of which um, are represented here today. And he continues to be a kind, engaging, faithful, attentive husband. 32 years on our way to happily ever after, I am happy to introduce to you today my husband, Elder Garrett W. Gong. President Sister Wheelwright, President's Council, members of our stake presidencies, dear brothers and sisters, aloha. aloha. In all the world, there are only three locations where we find in the same place a House of the Lord, a Brigham University campus, and a community of love, learning, and service. And only in Laie do we speak with such special affection of Ohana. Lokaihi, Pono, not to mention Ono, Hukilau, and Poi. <laughs> Years ago, even before I became a deacon, I came to visit Char relatives in Honolulu. Everyone was kind, but one night I became very homesick. I hid under the bed and would not come out until my aunt coaxed me to go out to get French fries. Perhaps you have felt homesick. You wanted to cry, maybe hide under your bed. Perhaps you felt that way when you first arrived here on campus. Laie is called paradise, but the language can be different. The food unusual, the customs and people unfamiliar. Perhaps you felt frightened or uncertain when you first arrived in the mission field, or when you return from your mission, or when you think about what you'll do after you graduate. Or perhaps you wonder if you will graduate. At times, we all feel alone, unsure, 
apprehensive. We may feel ill or wish we could do something over. In such moments, which we each feel, our Savior says, be not afraid, only believe. There are many ways and many reasons we feel uncertainty, doubt, or fear, or are lonely or afraid, but each is an opportunity to grow. Fear and faith do not exist at the same time, just as light and darkness do not. Believe our Lord Jesus Christ. Be not afraid, only believe. This morning, I'd like to share three ways our Savior's invitation to be not afraid, only believe can help us in our daily lives. First, his invitation to be not afraid, only believe can help us make important life decisions regarding faith, spouse, education, and career. Second, his invitation can help us see marvelous modern-day patterns of deepening conversion and establishing the restored church through real growth across the world, including through online missionary service. And third, our Savior's invitation, be not afraid, only believe, can help us understand the precious scriptural accounts where our Savior teaches he can and will make us whole and clean. We begin with life's decisions. A wonderful man, my father said, we make three great life decisions, faith, spouse, and education and career. Each life decision offers opportunity to set a course early where we can choose to not only believe, where we can choose not to be afraid, but only believe. First, the decision of faith. I'm grateful here with us today is Sister Jean Char Gong. As a young Honolulu teenager, she met missionaries from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, recognized gospel truth, and was baptized, the only member of her family to join at that time. Sister Gong married in the temple and has since raised and nurtured three children, 11 grandchildren, and now five great-grandchildren. She has served faithfully in church callings, including arranging chapel flowers and typing patriarchal blessings for her husband, who served many years as a patriarch. A beloved school teacher, Sister Gong taught over a course of 35 years hundreds of elementary students and even some of their children. She exemplified that each child, his or her parents, and their classroom teacher can learn as a team. Jean Char Gong, of course, is my mother. Her lifelong faith, hope, and charity make her a pioneer in our now four-generation gospel family. She has walked with faith in every footstep on a journey of 87 years. When we embark on life's journey, we do not know where it will take us, nor may we know exactly where we want to go. But if we will not be afraid, only believe, we can be happy at home, sealed in our generations, grateful to the Lord for a lifetime of tender mercies. Brothers and sisters, spiritually create a future where you become a true and strong link in your eternal family chain. Leave aside that which brings no lasting satisfaction, however enticing it may be. Live right today, whatever the challenge is. No one attaches a U-Haul trailer behind the hearse to take his or her material possessions to the cemetery. And the answer to the question, how much did they leave, is always everything. They had to leave everything. Through the atonement of Jesus Christ, we can keep every good feeling, every good relationship, every good deed, and leave behind every sorrow, worry, or care. Next, the decision of eternal marriage and family. I'm grateful Sister Susan Gong, my dear wife, is here and introduced me so kindly. I first met Sister Susan Lindsay, as she said, when she was preparing for a mission to Taiwan and I was teaching Chinese culture classes at the Provo MTC. After Sister Lindsay returned from her mission, our first date included climbing trees. We went out every day for 30 days, simple fun things like flying kites, playing racquetball, having a picnic. After that, I returned to graduate school in Oxford. With Susan in Provo and me in England, I say our transatlantic courtship was distance education of the best kind. It is why I can honestly say I earned a PhD in international relations. <laughs> 
When we sought the Lord's confirmation about marriage, we learned an important lesson. When I asked, Dear Heavenly Father, should I marry Susan? I had warm feelings, but not confirmation. It was when I acted with faith, when I said, Dear Heavenly Father, I love Susan, and I want to marry her, and I promise I will be the best husband I know how, and I meant it, that I received the clearest, sweetest confirmation. We are to act and not be acted upon, to study things out, ask and act in faith, and be grateful we can know in our minds and in our hearts. When I was a BYU student stake president, a group of faithful return missionaries invited me to join their cookout in the mountains. One young elder asked, President Gong, with so many beautiful and capable women in the world, how can you ever decide to get married? How do you know you will not meet someone tomorrow that you like better than the people you know today? He was serious and uh, very sincere. I imagine sisters asking a similar question. With respect to marriage, how do we not be afraid, only believe? We are to be wise, meet and become acquainted with possible marriage partners, learn to share openly and deeply things which matter most. Then we make a choice. We commit. We covenant with each other and with Heavenly Father. Life circumstances can and will change, but our sacred commitments and our covenants only grow stronger. We will never meet someone we like better tomorrow because we choose to like and love our eternal companion best each day. When Sister Gong and I were married, we did not know we would have four sons. We did not know we would live in Oxford, England, in Washington, D.C., in Beijing, Taipei, Provo. And we certainly did not know we would live in Hong Kong in our current calling and circumstances. That is life's adventure. In a meeting with Elder Neil A. Maxwell, I learned the promise in Doctrine and Covenants, section 90, verse 24, requires two conditions to be true. The verse reads, search diligently, pray always, and be believing, and all things shall work together for your good. For this verse to be true, the person making the promise must know how all things work together and the person must know how they work together for our good. There is such a person, God our loving Heavenly Father. He and His Son, Jesus Christ our Savior, can promise all things can work together for our good because they know how all things work together and they know what is good for us. In fact, they know us better and love us more than we know or love ourselves. In decisions relating to marriage, family, and other important questions in a sometimes uncertain future, we can be certain of God's love for each of us and our love for each other. We can thus not be afraid, only believe. Choosing not to be afraid, only believe can also help us in decisions about education and career. Life is too short to choose an educational or career path simply because they may seem prestigious or pay well. Supporting a family is, of course, important, but we become what we think and do. Guided by good sense, discussion, and your patriarchal blessing, choose education and career that you enjoy, that draw on all your faith and talents, and that allow you to contribute in unique ways you can barely imagine now. The world needs men and women of integrity, character, experience, and skill in every field, most importantly, in our homes, neighborhoods, communities, and countries. So dream a little. Let the Spirit inspire you. Then work really hard and really smart. In vital life's decisions of faith, marriage, and family, and also in school and work, our Savior invites us to not be afraid, only believe our first theme today. Our second theme today is that magnificent broader patterns of deepening conversion as His restored Church is established across the earth also give us reason to not be afraid, only believe. Prophecy is being fulfilled as a stone cut out from the mountain without hands fills the earth. 
As you may know, there are now congregations of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in 189 of the world's 224 nations and territories. While the church is found in almost every country, there are also centers of strength where many LDS church, led, church members live, both within countries and among countries. For example, did you know that there are now three countries, each with, one, with over one million members of the church, the United States, Mexico, and Brazil? And there are now 21 countries, each with 100,000 or more LDS church members, three in North America, 12 in Central and South America, one in Europe, four in Asia, and now one in Africa. Did you know that there are over 100,000 members of the church today in Nigeria? The establishment of his restored church in these countries reflects a similar pattern, a gradual building of a strong member foundation and then an inflection point of accelerating real growth. Conversion deepens as we follow the doctrine of Christ and endure to the end. The family and the church are strengthened by the priesthood. Preach my gospel missionaries serve, then return with honor to raise second, third, and fourth generation church families. Individuals become families. Families gather in groups and branches, then become wards and stakes of Zion. Stakes become places where Zion increases in beauty and in holiness, places for defense and for refuge from the storm, and places for your baptisms for your dead. We note in each of these verses the close connection between stakes and temples. Deepening conversion can occur weekly as we renew sacramental covenants. Baptism by water, which washes from the outside, and baptism by fire, which burns from within to purify and sanctify. The gospel going forth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people fulfills prophecy in two ways. First, every day across the world, the gospel is literally going forth. And second, every day, right before our eyes, nation, kindreds, tongues, and peoples come together on a campus, in a ward, in a family home evening group, in an apartment. If you want to help the gospel go forth to every nation, please be a good example of the believers to your roommates and classmates. The work of salvation is hastening, including through digital and online missionary work. Our son, Elder Matthew Gong, recently returned from the England-London South Mission, where missionaries come from over 40 different countries a melting pot, like Provo, Rexburg, or Laie. Elder Matthew Gong and online or digital zone missionaries in the Asia area and other places around the world are discovering online missionary work is real missionary work. Communities are gated, but inboxes are open. Online proselyting can reach many and one at the same time. Missionary work has never just been about knocking doors or street contacting. Missionary work has always been about bringing people to Christ. Today, this includes talking to people where they are, which may be online. Members become good online examples by sharing gospel-centered messages on social pages and answering questions when asked. Members and missionaries help each other learn to be polite and appropriate, no matter what others say and to engage in open, positive, and constructive chat and online conversations. Online missionaries can reach hundreds or thousands of people, have an impact in their lives, and help bring them to Christ. Many people reluctant to share their home address or phone number will give their email address. For example, double opt-ins get messages to those who want them. Individuals click to subscribe, and click to receive gospel messages. They can also click out. In one mission, 5,600 people receive weekly gospel messages, each based on LDS.org and Mormon.org. MailChimp and other online analytics can indicate which gospel messages elicit the most positive responses and greatest resonance to personal lives and concerns. Those of you preparing for missions 
will recognize online missionary work has other unique dimensions. People often openly share online personal thoughts and feelings they might never share in a face-to-face -face conversation. At the same time, some people using, use being anonymous to say things they would not say in person. This means online or chat conversations often get to the point faster and more directly. Because online missionary work is at least as spiritually and emotionally demanding as traditional proselyting, online missionaries are grateful for attentive mission leaders with whom they can regularly share what they're experiencing, including faith and gospel growth. Thank you, elders and sisters, who are learning how to use every worthy way to invite investigators, new and established and returning members, and all others to come unto Christ. Thank you, return missionaries, for your service. And thank you, each student and friend of BYU Hawaii, for realizing your Facebook page or your online presence reflects you. Photos and what and how you post, directly and indirectly, can invite others to come to Christ. Finally, the third theme of our discussion today is to place our Savior's invitation to be not afraid, only believe, in spiritual context, to understand he can and wants to make us whole and clean. In the New Testament, Mark chapter 5, verse 22, we read, Then cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and when he saw Jesus, Jairus fell at his feet, and besought Jesus greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. Jairus loves his little daughter and wants her to live. In faith, this Jewish synagogue leader employs the Savior to lay your hands on her, that she may be healed. Brothers and sisters, please have faith in priesthood blessings. Priesthood brethren, be worthy at any moment to administer to the sick if called upon. Later, while Jerish Jesus yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? Imagine the father's pain at that news. He was hurrying home in faith that Jesus could save his daughter, but now his precious little girl, his little lamb, had died. Yet, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, the now grieving father, be not afraid, only believe. Jesus taketh the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him. In other words, he took the parents and the priesthood leaders, Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and entereth in where the little girl was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumi, which is being interpreted damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway, please notice it was immediately, the damsel arose and walked, for she was at the age of 12 years. Among us, in our circle of family and friends, are those who are figuratively or actually in a kind of spiritual sleep. Perhaps our parents, spouse, or other family members do not yet understand the wonderful gospel we have found. Perhaps a dear friend or former missionary companion has temporarily lost his or her way. Perhaps a roommate is going through the motions of attending church, but inside is uncertain or doubting. In any of these situations, our Lord says, be not afraid, only believe. Belief and fact and faith are principles of action. They're also principles of love. The principles by which this wondrous creation operates reflect their creator. In the Holy Land, perhaps in his own city of Capernaum in Galilee, our Savior first declared his ministry, fulfilling prophecy with these words. 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach repentance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Our Savior desires to heal us physically and spiritually, and spiritual and physical are closely connected. Whole and clean are the terms the scriptures often use to describe Jesus' healing. The atonement of Jesus Christ heals us from the awful monster of death and hell. Death, the physical death of the body, and hell, the spiritual death which separates us from Heavenly Father. Our Savior wants to make us whole. Our Savior wants to make us clean. He can and will mend our bodies and our spirits. In due course, he will remove every sickness and infirmity. In due course, he will cleanse every repented sin and misdeed. As we repent, he will help us forgive others, including ourselves. Dear brothers and sisters, it's by faith and belief, by being clean and pure in purpose, by the desire and strength of goodness and compassion, and often in the case of ordained brethren, by the power and authority of the holy priesthood, that our spirits can be taught, and when appropriate, can be commanded to heal our physical bodies. The spirit and the body are the soul of man. That is the light which is in all things, which giveth life to all things, and is the law by which all things are governed, even the power of God. Dear brothers and sisters, be not afraid, only believe. Believe God is our loving Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ is the living Son of the living God. Believe the family is the most important unit in time and eternity. Act with faith and commitment to become the eternal companion you wish to marry. Wherever you are on the path of marriage, getting acquainted, dating, engaged, newly married, or married for many years, please remember eternity is created a day at a time. Make yours a happy forever family, not simply a happy family or simply a forever family. Believe moral agency and individual responsibility are key. Truly, where much is given, much is required. Believe the Book of Mormon is the word of God. I'm a witness that those who ponder in our hearts the message of the Book of Mormon and then ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if the book is true, will gain a testimony of the Book of Mormon's truth and divinity by the power of the Holy Ghost. I also witness those who gain this divine witness from the Holy Spirit will know by the same power that Jesus is the Savior of the world, that Joseph Smith is his revelator and prophet in these last days, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the Lord's kingdom once again established on the earth, preparatory to the second coming of the Messiah. Believe the mercy, merits, and grace of God Believe also the law of the harvest. Today's decisions and actions bring tomorrow's blessings. When we obtain any blessing from God, it is by obedience to that law upon which it is predicated. Finally, if you're uncertain, lonely, undecided, embarrassed, ashamed, angry, or otherwise afraid, as we may all feel at some times, please remember our Savior. He is always here for us. He is always here with us, inviting us individually, gently, powerfully, lovingly. Be not afraid, only believe. In the sacred and holy name of Jesus Christ, amen.